Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars and some of my favourite people and a man I've loved and admired for many, many years. Lionel Blair, how nice to see you again. How nice to see you, Alex. How are you? I am delicious, but not as good as you. I mean, we've just had a lovely lunch reminiscing about so many years yes. in show business. It's how many is. years have you been doing this? Well, it's the same as Bruce, really. It's about 60. What a life you've had and what a career you've yes. had. We're going to get on to the people you've worked with and some of the shows you've done in a bit, but I wonder as you sit here now whether you pinch yourself because you do realize it's extraordinary to have had the longevity and success that you've got yeah it's it's strange do you know and one person that doesn't realize it is me i sometimes go out and i think oh well i'll be all right there nobody will know me and like where we've just had lunch which is the most popular restaurant in london i thought well, nobody will say know me here and they all did and when you're greeted by the maitre d' and said, oh, Mr. Blair, how nice to see you, you go, oh, yeah, that's nice. It's nice to hear that. I'm just amazed, though, that you're so surprised that people know you. I said during our lunch that you are a star and a legend. That word's overused, but when you've done it as long as you have and been in our hearts for so long, it's not surprising that the people next to you, opposite you, around you, are going to be thrilled to be in the company of someone like you. Yes, and I tell you what it is really with me, I'm so thrilled and have been since I put my foot on the first stage, you know, to be in this business. I have just loved it. And to have met the people that I've met and played the places that I've played, I feel so lucky. And But what I, I don't realise is that people remember me, <laughs> which is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's very flattering, it's very nice. And I'm not being silly, but I really feel blessed with what I've had in the in the past. You know, it's it's something that still surprises me when somebody asks me for my autograph. It really does. I don't know why it surprises you. I first spoke to you 20 years ago when you were in pantomime in Nottingham and to see the reaction of the crowd there was amazing. But then we fast forward 15 years or so and you appear on Celebrity Big Brother, which brought you a whole new audience and a whole new level of fame. And a younger audience, what is so incredible now, are the young people that say, hello, Lionel. Usually, it's, hello, Lionel, all right. <laughs> but now it's kids that remember me. And um, and know me, and uh, love the fact that I was still one of them, if you know what I mean. And I said naughty words like anybody else would. <laughs> that show is a risk, and there's always a fear you go on that and you could be edited and that they push you to lose your temper. Was there any risk in that? Because I know when some people get offered it, they immediately dismiss it, as I think you did. Yeah, well, I, I didn't dismiss it. What annoyed me was there were certain things that did happen in the house that they never showed, which upset me. I remember Dappy, do you remember Dappy and I were called to the diary room and we said, have we done anything wrong? They said, no. We just thought it would be a good idea if you and Dappy did a rap song together and make it up as you go along. And we looked at each other, so Dappy started it, and then I followed, and we did it for about two minutes. And Big Brother suddenly went, wow, it was never shown. Because I said to my wife, what did you think of the number I did with Dappy? And they went, we never saw it. <laughs> now that was a shame, and I was upset about that, because it put, made me do something with someone so contemporary, so today. Uh, but I also did a, um, a reality show called The Farm. Do you remember The Farm? I do. With a man called Flavor Flav from Public Enemy. Now, he and I did not get on. <laughs> I couldn't bear the man. <laughs> he was unbelievable. Whereas Dappy was adorable and was sweet. And teach me how to dance, Lionel, all that was going on. And he was, he was lovely. Flavor Flav was not flavor of my month. <laughs> You're a classy star and you've been around so long you know how to do things properly. I wonder whether the bathroom stuff, the sharing the bedroom stuff in Big Brother was something you were fearful of because it's something I personally would struggle with. Well, I hate, I, I did say, I don't mind sharing the bedroom, but a single bed, please. I don't want to share a bed with anyone. <laughs> 
Yes. And they went, that's okay, and they gave a single bed. The worst thing about it was that when lights were out, the shutters came down and you were literally locked in this bedroom. I mean, you couldn't get out even to go and make, if you got up in the night and said, oh, I've had a cup of tea, you couldn't get out. And there was one bathroom. Right. And if you wanted to go to the loo, you had to <laughs> climb over beds. <laughs> that I didn't like. That was the only thing I didn't like, the, go, the going to bed bit. But otherwise it was fun. Let's go back to the beginning and focus right. on some of the wonderful heroes that you were blessed to work with because we were talking about over lunch. They just don't seem to be making them like they did. And you had the house in days of these great, big, whopping, huge stars. I, I guess being a sponge of entertainment, you couldn't help but learn from these people. Well, that's how I did learn my job. I didn't go to a dance school or acting school. I managed to get into a play. No, my first thing, I was I was a munchkin in the Wizard of Oz or a pantomime in Croydon. That was my very first, pro what I call, professional job. And um, the man playing the straw man said to me, they're looking for an understudy for a little boy in a play called Watch on the Rhine, on tour. And uh, I've said, you could do it. So I went and auditioned for a man called Emily Williams, who was a great star in this country. And I auditioned, and I got the part as understudy to this boy who looked like Jimmy Clitheroe, quite honestly, uh, who got the part. Well, we were going to start the tour in Edinburgh. It had been on tour, but the boy that was in it had to leave. So this boy took over, and I was the understudy. And our, our first date was Newcastle. And somebody said to me, when you go to Newcastle, you go over the Tay Bridge or, the, you know, you could throw a penny out of the train and make a wish. So I did that and I wished that I got the part wow. and not the understudy. Anyway, we get to the theater and I don't know if you know Roger Livesey. Remember the life and death of Colonel Blimp? Well, Colonel Blimp, he played my father. He was the father. And um, he saw this little Jimmy Clitheroe kid and hated him. He said, let's try the understudy. They tried me and they went, he'll do it. And that's how I got that part. At that time, I didn't know what the word understudy meant. Under what? Under, what's understudy? I didn't even know what the word meant. And I asked them, I said, what's understudy? And they said, well, if the little boy's ill, you go on. I went, oh. And that's why I went, oh. <laughs> That's why I made that wish on the train. That was my lessons. They were my lessons. And it started like that from show to show. Every show I went into, there were people in it that taught me things. <laughs> and that was my college education, if you like. Do you know how many shows you've done over the years? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> I really don't. I, um, no, I, hundreds, hundreds. But everyone, and I've said this before, you know, every show you go into, they become your family. They are, and if you hear somebody in another show being derogatory somebody in your you stand up for them saying it's just a minute don't say that you know and they become your family and I, I I've always treated uh, the casts of any show I've been in as part of my family talking of family there's been one constant in your life next year's going to be an amazing year as you're going to celebrate yeah. your 60th wedding anniversary yeah. do you think having the backbone of your family your wife has been the reason that you're here and saying today. Yes. yes, I do think that. I think when you were young and with all the dancers and all the drinks, I was never a drinker, really. I was a party girl. I was never, I'd have a drink, maybe, but I was never into drugs and I was never into drinks. I know a lot of people that were and some of them became very good friends of mine who are no longer with us. And that is very sad, but I was, no, I'm not saying I was a goody good boy, I wasn't, I was a naughty boy, but 
in a different sort of way. <laughs> what different sort of ways were you a naughty boy, Lionel? <laughs> oh, I played around a lot. And I did, when I did the five past eight shows up in Scotland, now, I have to say, Scotland is where I learnt my job. It was, I was doing... Well, it's a lot, it's so funny. I'm going back and back. People say, the first... When was the first Palladium you did? Well, I was walking in town and I met Shaney Wallace, who had just become a, a kind of star in the West End. And she said, um, I'm going to do Sunday night at the Palladium and I'm doing a foggy day in London town and uh, I need somebody to come on and dance with me. Will you do it? I went, well, the Palladium. <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> And I did, and that was my first Sunday night at the Palladium. But the reason I say this is because before that, Shaney and I and another friend, we all went to Knock de la Zoot in Belgium for a holiday. And I'd been doing a series as a boy dancer on a television show called The Jewel and Morris Show, called Return It Up. And the choreographer was George Carden. And while I, I'm in Knock, the telephone goes in my bed and I think, who knows I'm here? And it was Michael Mills, the TV director, who did Some Others Do Have Them, you know. He said, hello, Lionel. I said, what, what do you want? He said, well, George Carton is leaving the show because he's going to France to do a show. And I said, yes, you can leave, but find me another choreographer. And he said, I think Lionel Blair could do it. And I said to him, yes, I think you're right. And that's how I got my first choreography job. Wow. And I didn't even know what the word choreographer meant then, <laughs> believe me. Little boy from Tottenham, not really. And, um, because I'd been one of the dancers on the Jewel Water show. And they booked me. And they were called the Lionel Blair Dancers and I did the choreography for it. Well, Jimmy and Ben were lovely to me, Jewel and Warriors. I said, you know, Lana, we'd like to do a routine with you. And I went, oh, all right, what would you like? We'd like to do singing in the rain like Gene Kelly, you know. I said, all right, he said, but we want you to do it with us so we can follow you when we go wrong. <laughs> and I went, oh, all right, and I did. And from then on, it was Lionel Blair and his dancers. And that's how that all started. It's interesting when we look at your career because obviously you're a dancer, but you're also a personality, you're also a TV presenter, yeah. you're also a comedian. Would you say on your gravestone it's Lionel Blair dancer? Is that the thing that's closest no, to your heart? That. Lionel Blair entertainer, I hope. All rounder. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Not just one thing. Because it's interesting that the dancing has defined you, but it's the personality that people love you for. Yeah, it can also give you. <coughs> I'd been doing it for so long, you know, I did every television show, the Arthur Astley show, the Harry Seacombe show, the Dave King show, I, I did the Dickie Henderson, was wonderful to me. And very often, and I'm very flattered, they would ask for me and ask me to do it in their shows, so that was really nice. And um, I remember... Um, an American singer came over to do a series. And the director was Bill Ward, and we were talking about how we were going to do the show. And then Joe came, and I gave my ideas, which they liked. And then Joe Stafford came, and I said, well, who, who? She said, I've invited a few guests to come over from America. I said, oh, who, who's coming? She said, oh, Ella Fitzgerald, Peggy Lee, Bob Hope, <laughs> um, Rosemary Clooney. I went, they're coming over to do this show? And, yes, and I worked with them all. Mel Torme, and I worked with every one of them. And usually they said, will you do something with us? And I was put in their numbers. Does it ever become normal when that level of star know who you are? Well, <laughs> it was funny. The first time I went to America, 
because I said to my dancers when we were breaking, I said, look, I'm getting a bit brainwashed, actually. I said, I want to go to New York and then go to Las Vegas and get some fresh ideas of, of shows and things, like comedians do, like all sorts of people do. So, And I went to New York and I saw a few shows and then I went to Las Vegas and I saw Betty Grable, would you believe, <laughs> and Danny Kaye and, and, you know, and I thought, well, I'm here. I might go to Los Angeles and see that Hollywood sign. I wanted, I've always wanted to see that. And I saw that sign. I went to New York, booked into the Roosevelt Hotel downtown Hollywood. And I sat on the bed and I thought, what do I do now? Well, going back a couple of years, and I auditioned for a show called Kiss, Kiss and Tell. And there were two boys up for this one part. And I got it. And the other boy didn't get it because he was about to go into the arm, was Roger Moore. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so I get to the Roosevelt Hotel going back now and sit on the bed and think. So I phoned the most important agent in Los Angeles and said, look, I realize you don't give out your client's numbers, but do you handle Roger Moore? And they said, yes, we do. I said, well, would you do me a favor? Would you give him a ring and just say, Lionel Blair's in town, staying at the Roosevelt Hotel, uh, and I'd love to meet up with him. Within five minutes, he called me, he said, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I'm just here to look around and see. He said, where are you staying? I said, the Roosevelt. He said, pack your bags. You're staying with me and Dorothy. And was when he was married to Dorothy Squires. And I went and stayed with them in, in Los Angeles. I'm staying with Roger, and he t took me on the set of the TV he was making and took me everywhere. And then Dorothy took me out, and I get a telegram. Because I tell them in London where I'm staying with Roger and Dorothy. Come home at once, you're doing the Sammy Davis Jr. show. And I looked, I said to Dorothy, look at that, you bloody hell, off you go, you better go back. <laughs> that was Welsh. <laughs> and so I went back, I had to come back to England because I was doing the Sammy Davis Jr. show. And as I got off the plane, the director met me. He said, we're going to meet Sammy now. The Pigal, just up the road from here. And he said, Sammy wants his own choreographer, but you're still in as associate producer. So I went, oh, I said, I'm quite pleased because who am I to tell Sammy Davis what to do? <laughs> so we went to the press conference. And it was funny, going back to what you said, how does it feel? Because Al Burnett, who ran the Pigal, said, Sammy, this is Lionel Blair. And Sammy turned to me and said, oh, so you're Lionel Blair. Shirley Jones says you're adorable. Now, one Saturday Spectacular, I did the Shirley Jones TV show, and we met then. Wow. Isn't that nice? That's incredible, isn't it? One wrong move and your career could be over forever. Couldn't Absolutely, <laughs> but that's, that's what happened. And we got on like a house on fire. He said, are you coming to my opening? I said, yes, I'm bringing a friend called uh, Alma Kogan. And um, Alma and I went to the first night. Well, that's again where I learned how to do cabaret. Watching Sammy Davis use an audience and work an audience and perform. It was such a lesson. It was just wonderful, just wonderful. That's the only way. He was so nice. And after the show, he said, are you coming back to the house? Which was his suite at the Mayfair Hotel. <laughs> and we went back there, and I said, I'm seeing you tomorrow because we've got a meeting uh, for your show. Because he was doing Sammy Meets the British. And there was a, a producer director called Brown Tesla, who became head of LBZ. Um, came with me and he and Sammy did not get on 
and we're sitting there, and Brian, who was a very lovely man, but frightfully, now you're going to do this, and you're going, no, you don't say that. To someone like Sammy, he said, would you like to do such and such? And it was going from bad to worse. Home. And I said, may I say something? And Sammy looked at me and said, what? I said, look, we've got a place here called Battersea Funfair. It would be great if you took an open-top car with about eight kids, every colour, creed, race, everything, to the funfair, and it's closed, and you make it open, and we go round, you know, and he went, that's what we'll do, but don't you dare tell anybody it was your idea. <laughs> Just going back to something we were talking about, about your private life, your home life, your yeah. family life. Um, I'm fascinated to know whether that grounding uh, makes you the person you are today and what it means to you. Because yeah. to have that seems to me a huge blessing that when it goes right, you can celebrate. And when it goes wrong, you've got somebody who can listen to you and make it right again. Absolutely. When I got married to Susan, I met Sammy and Sammy and I were great friends. So if Sammy said, jump, you jump. And we just got married, back from our honeymoon, and Sammy was coming into town. And we met at a restaurant. I said, Sammy, this is my wife, Susan, Susan, Sammy. And Sammy said to Susan, you've got a lot of competition, now I'm in town. <laughs> and she looked at him and said, you watch me. And I went, oh. <laughs> so one night we're in the car and I said, oh, we're going to Sammy's tonight. She went, I don't really want to. I'm a bit tired because we've been out every night. I said, don't be silly. We've got to. She said, I don't want to. And that was our first row. But she was right. She said, Lionel, you don't have to do everything that Sammy wants you to do. And he adored my wife. He absolutely adored her, and they got on. I mean, she cries now when we hear that, his commercial, I Gotta Be Me, I mean, you know. And he was our friend until we lost him, you know, but he had, he did things for me. After that meeting, when I made that suggestion, we were about to leave and he said to me, do you have to leave? I went, no, no. He said, well, will you hang around? And Brian Tesla left and they, he said, would you take me shopping? I want to go and buy presents for my friends in America. So we're walking around. Can you imagine me and Sammy Davis walking around Piccadilly and Carriage and Dunhills and everywhere? And people kept asking me for my autograph, <laughs> but not him. And he said, if one more person asks you and not me, there's going to be trouble. That's how I felt during lunch. <laughs> He said, do you know what? I'd like to do a number with you in the show. I said, oh, Brian would never allow it. I went, he said, it's my show. We got back to the Mayfair. He called Brian and he said, I want to do a routine with Lionel. And he said, pardon? <laughs> he said, I would like to do a routine with Lionel, like a hat shot routine, you know, where I buy a bottle. A derby, a bubble, you know, and we made it up as we went along. Anyway, we did that show, and it was unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. And but to show what dancers are thought of, even choreographers, and I was a, a name choreographer then. Sammy was looking at the script. And looked at him. He said, Lionel, will you go away, please? Went, oh. And he insisted that it was special guest star, Lionel Blair. Yeah. Fabulous. And Brian said, but it's only Lionel. And that's how they think, you see, in England. And that's how it was. Yeah, but who cares when Sammy Davis Jr. is willing to Sammy give you that accolade? Said, it's got to be done. Fabulous. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it is. And then we look at today. As we sit here now, you're about to turn 60, something like that. I wish. <laughs> How old are you now? Do you not know? Tell us. What do you think? 
You're certainly not far off 80, are you? I'm just over 80. And as we sit here, I mean, you look as sprightly as you've ever looked. I told you earlier, and I mean it. You look incredible. You have such mental vigour. You have an incredible physicality. I wonder what's left to achieve and what you would still love to do, because I know you still have ambition, don't you? Well, yes, I do. There was a, a, t a time when uh, we had a house in Bushy outside London with a swimming pool. You know, it was wonderful. And I said to my wife, you know, I'm fed up with dancing. We just had two kids, two. Before my, I've got three, but we just had the two. She said, you realise this house has got to go because you won't get the money in straight plays that you get in light entertainment. And I had a whole publicity campaign and everything. And this is my one regret. French and Saunders were going to do a sketch and they asked if I would appear as a game show host with a sequin jacket and I turned it down. And do you know, I think they've never forgiven me. It's, that was a really stupid thing for me to do, but I was going to be, and I, I was about to appear in Rose and Grants and Guildenstern are dead at the Piccadilly Theatre in London. I wasn't going to do silly light end shows. Idiot that I was. Do you think there was a period where you took yourself too seriously or something happened? I was trying to. Yes, I was trying to. I thought, I did not do Hamlet, but I wanted to do serious stuff. Because I suppose at, a time, at that time I thought, well, by the time I get to 40, it's going to be over, you know. Before, thank God, it's not. And uh, I should go back to acting, you know. Uh, but no. I stuck with it. Now I want to go back to acting. I would like to. And I know you were telling me earlier, one of the things you have ambition to do is to be in a soap, yes. which is surprising to many people. Why would that be something that would tempt you back? Well, again, it's like having a family. It's like being in a show because they become your family. And everybody that goes into soap say, the rest of the cast are so, it's like being with a family. So. I think I would enjoy that. And I would enjoy not being Lionel Blair for a time. Do you know what I mean? Not, uh, I'll be Joe so Soaps or whatever. <laughs> you know, I know, like, for instance, in EastEnders, uh, uh, Matt D'Angelo had a, a hairdressing shop. I want to take that over because my dad was a barber. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that would suit me lovely. And I'd be a barber in the East End, which would be perfect. <laughs> Why do you think it hasn't happened up to now? I don't know, they just go, because I still look like Lionel Blair. It's <laughs> well, what well Lionel said. Blair. I know, it's what <laughs> you said. But you know how some people don't look like they did yes. when they were younger? I mean, if you look at Ian Lavender now, you wouldn't... <laughs> you, would you? No, it was Pike <laughs> from Dad's Army, yeah. you see. So it's that sort of thing. I, I have to dress up to go to the hairdresser to go and get my hair cut because people say, oh, what did Lionel Blair look like? You know, because I'm instantly recognised, which is wonderful and very flattering. But so I always make sure that my hair's combed and my flies are up. You know? Yet you are a man of the people. As you leave here today, you're going to get on the bus and again, it will go be surprising to you. People are going to know who you are. You do love that though, don't you? Oh, of course. I mean, when I get on a train, the first thing I see people do, as soon as I get on the train, I see them take out my mobile. <laughs> You'll never guess who just walked in this train. <laughs> how fabulous. Um, one thing I want to talk about show business, which has changed, is how people get famous and why they're famous. And then this new breed of uh, fame, which is unfortunate, where people are named and shamed for stuff that they either haven't done or certainly haven't been proved of doing. Yeah. Um, we've had a campaign on this show about Cliff Richard, the fact yeah. that for 600 days he sat there accused of something they haven't either proved or released him over. Does it seem to you unbelievable as it does to me that that can be okay and acceptable? Because well, on behalf of Cliff, it, it seems scandalous. It, it was awful. Knowing Cliff the way I, I've known him since he first started, I've known Cliff all the time. I've been in the business almost, and he's one of the nicest, sweetest gentlemen. He, was, he is a gentleman. And for that 
to happen in this day and age, I think, is is frightening. And it's it well, it's just you know awful. I, I can't even begin to think how he must have felt through all these years. And I've got to tell you, I had a through few things named at me before I was married. And when I did get married, nobody believed, get married, nobody believed it. And because it's lasted, I mean, I, the week I got married, Bob Monkhouse was on uh, doing the Palladium. He said, well, Lionel Blair's got married a week ago. It's lasted, hasn't it? <laughs> well, it's lasted 49 years and coming up to our 50th. But it's, what's interesting about what you say there, even in jokes, is yeah. that being a Romeo of your day could come and bite you on the arse in 2016 is unbelievable, that somebody could accuse you of something over 60 years ago, and how do you disprove it? I don't know. I don't know, but I mean, I tell you what's frightening is the internet and the, the you know, the, the Twitter and all that. But I don't think I did do, I mean, flirted, obviously, and, one had little liaison with all sorts of people. But I never, I don't think I've never behaved that badly as like falling out of places drunk. Do you know, I've never been drunk in my life. I've had a drink, I've been a bit tipsy, but I've never been drunk. Well, and also we've all got a past. What seems extraordinary to me is once you become a celebrity now, you have to sort of have had no past beyond today because people... Absolutely. That is, is it's terrible. It's, it, it's, it's just scary. And it's not just Cliff. I mean, we look at Jimmy Tarbot. I interviewed him over a year ago and he told me the uh, seven coppers that turned up at his door raided his house and took his computers. You know, it ruined his life for a year. Jim Davison lost nearly a quarter of a million pounds defending himself with no basis. The woman who accused him said he was at a theatre he wasn't even at. It, it, it's as it, There has to be a change in the law, doesn't there, that people can accuse you, but you shouldn't be named until you're found guilty or there is a charge you can be named because it seems like anybody could say anything today and it's you can no be no good saying today any publicity is good publicity it ain't no. not anymore it used to be but it ain't anymore have you heard from Cliff since all this happened because I hear no, he's no I haven't no because we're not that close I mean we know each other as we, but if I would suddenly phone him it's like no. you can't imagine though can you how it must feel oh 75 years and I've known you know I've known Tarby for you know, there are some other people that I don't, you know, know, but but not Cliff, <laughs> no way. I mean, Sue and I were in the Caribbean a couple of years ago, and I, we had his driver. So I said, will you tell Cliff that I'm here and I'd love to, to see him? And uh, he, he left a message to say he was leaving that day. He's so sorry to have missed me, but if I'm back again, call him. That, you know, so he was, he's a lovely guy. We wish him well, it must be terrible. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think he's all right. Did you see that picture of him in the paper today? Dancing away, wonderful. Fabulous. Before we go, we've got to touch on some of the legends we've lost that I know you love very much. Last week we lost Ronnie Corbett, yeah. uh, a wonderful legend and a great star. He was a sweet man and I've known him 50 years. And uh, we worked together, I have to say, through David Williams, who did the one Ronnie show and we did a sketch together and which was wonderful and I, I, the following year I did the Edinburgh Festival and Ronnie came to see it with his whole family to see my show which is the show I told you about that I do and he loved it and stayed for publicity pictures and he was just wonderful you know and Scylla well what can I say when I did Blackpool Night Out I did a created a new dance uh, we, we're going to have the Beatles on. And they said, we'll do it if Lionel does a routine to one of our numbers. <laughs> so I had to do a routine to uh, help. And I called it The Kick. And uh, Brian Epstein loved it and sent out The Kick Tour with the Everly Brothers, Sill and Black, Billy J. Kramer, and Lionel Blair and his dancers. And we did a one night stand tour for four weeks. Fantastic. Does it make you very reflective when we seem to have a litany of these people passing the Sillas, oh. the Ronnies? I mean, it seems like we've had a lot lately. 
Oh, I feel my pulse every day, believe me. I, you've just got to go, go with it. If it's your time, it's your time. And I hope I want to see my grandchildren grow up a bit. I've got three, and I'm besotted with them. That's why I don't like leaving town that much. I, I live near them, they live near me, and we see each other all the time. I want to leave you on this thought. Firstly, I'd love you to do a final tour. I know it's a lot of effort. I know it's a lot of time yeah. and dedication, but I think people would love to see you again, even if it's just a QA and a and you telling your yeah. stories, people would love it. B, I hope you know how loved you are, because I'm not sure you fully do. I mean, the affection you've had just in the few hours we spent together today is extraordinary. Well, that's very kind of you. You fix the tour, fix it up, and people, if you're listening to this, please phone in and then I'll do it. And very fine. 60 years in show business, it's no mean feat, and the people you've worked with is unbelievable. What a great life. Yes, it has been. Thank you, God. I say it very often. Thank you, God. Lionel Blair, it's been a great honour. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. God bless. <laughs>